done this several times before, but we'll just quickly do a couple of polls because we would like to know who we are managing to reach. So could I ask you all please to type in the box where you reside um, and uh, we'll quickly see whether the demographics are changing. changing. Uh, is that the first Canadian one that we've seen? I don't know. Guatemala? Particularly if you're from interesting places. Unusual probably places. the first Guatemalan we've seen. But I think that's our speaker. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. But that still counts. <laughs> Yes, of course it does. Of course it does. Any more? That's only 11. There's 30 of us in the room. No? Okay, don't want to labour the point. Okay, that's grand. I shall end that poll then. And another quick one, if you don't mind. So, the next question is, what is your main occupation or role? So, I'll just clear those answers and reopen the poll. Could you please click on... Oh, that was quick. These students have a very quick reaction, don't they? Did you see that? Gosh gracious. <laughs> and there's a goodly number of students here by the looks of it. <laughs> Are you going to go to the, the, the student cafe later on? We had a very good one earlier on. Anybody else wanting to click? Gosh, <laughs> we are outnumbered with students. Maybe we should change what we're doing. <laughs> Chris. <laughs> Very good. Maybe You're anticipating so. Anticipating my question now. <laughs> okay. Obviously, everybody's getting a bit bored with these things. Okay. So I will just close that just now, and do a quick final poll, please. If you'll just bear with me for two seconds, and we want to know where you are joining us from for the poll. Just clear the answers. Reopen it. Where are you all from? Oh, we have people back from a clinical facility. Fascinating watching the, statistics, the, the, the percentages going down, isn't it? Ah, now I want to know what is other. So whoever put other, could they please pop it into the um, chat box out of interest? I'm a nosy person, really. Okay, anybody else going to put anything? No? Okie dokie. Thank you very much then. Right, I am getting rid of all of that and over to you Chris. Thanks very much Linda. Okay, um, it's my uh, my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Annalee Reid. Annalee is a medical laboratory scientist but has decided that having done that for a few years she wants to become a midwife rather than go to medical school and she's currently in her second year at midwifery school. Um, she's currently in Guatemala, although she uh, comes from New York. Um, Annalise's presentation, you, me, um, proctolosis or rectal fluid infusion is a low resource and effective method for use in out of hospital environments should fluid replacement therapy become necessary. Use of proctolysis, I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong, during war times was ineffective for certain casualties, but when administered in a timely fashion, it served to rehabilitate the subject until other therapies could begin, like blood transfusion or surgery or intravenous therapy and so on. The examination of several studies provides an understanding that the rectal colon readily absorbs fluids, electrolytes and even drugs across its mucosa, validating its use for fluid replacement therapy in emergent situations where IV access is unavailable or difficult. Midwives are often in out-of-hospital environments and or working in certain state jurisdictions that prevent them from using IV fluid replacement when postpartum hemorrhage, hyperemesis or dehydration warrant the use of fluid replacement therapy. This presentation explains why rectal fluid infusion is an easy and effective method to accomplish fluid replacement therapy. So now I'd like to hand over to Annalie Reid. Annalie. Yes, hi, good morning, good afternoon, good night to all of you present here. And of course, happy International Day of Midwifery. Um, as Chris said, my name is Annalie Reed, and I am a current medical laboratory scientist, but most importantly, a student midwife. And this presentation is based on research and analysis that I've recently done, and will explain the use of proctoclysis 
or rectal fluid infusion and how it can be used in medicine and most importantly midwifery today. So, what is proctoclysis? <laughs> well, if we break down the Latin, according to Merriam-Webster's Medical Dictionary, proct means rectum, and we have clysis, which means the introduction of large amounts of fluid into the body. And so when we put those terms together, we have proctoclysis, which is the introduction of large amounts of fluid into the rectum to replace that loss, i.e. hemorrhage or hyperemesis, to provide nutrients, i.e. a woman who's been dehydrated or a woman that might be intrapartum and unable or unwilling to eat, um, or to maintain blood pressure, which could technically be all of the above. So, a little history of proctoclysis. In 1909, Dr. John Benjamin Murphy created the Murphy drip. And this was his method to infuse needed fluids into the body via the rectum. And as you can see here on the um, picture, the top portion, which has the number seven and one, is the fluid reservoir where you know various solutions were put. And then there's kind of a little dripper that is at point six and 23 where that fluid reservoir would slowly or quickly drip down into the tube that was connected to the insertion point where they would enter into the rectum. Um, Proctoclysis was also used in World War I. It was used in the Vietnam War. And then around the 21st century, it kind of got booted out of the way by IVs, um, intraosseous, therapy, intraperitoneal, parenteral, and hypodermoclysis. Um, and those are other methods of fluid replacement therapy that are out there now. So what would we need proctoclysis for if we have all of these wonderful other methods to use, right? Well, one uh, set of researchers decided to state that the rectal route is one of the least efficient routes of fluid administration. And in patients with peripheral vasoconstriction, intraosseous route would probably offer the patient the best chance of survival. So my question then is, well, OK, intraosseous is definitely very effective, and it's fast. And in cases of vasoconstriction, because that is you know, one of the things that we can't use IV access if there's vasoconstriction. Um, what happens when there's no option to use intraosseous therapy? As this is a difficult and it's painful procedure, it requires special sterile conditions and it needs specialized equipment. What happens when IV access is unobtainable due to the vasoconstriction that results from fluid loss or dehydration? Or in the cases of some midwives that you know practice in the States, I know, um, sometimes IV therapy is not legal. Like We're not able to have IVs on hand to use during a birth, or should we need them? So that goes out of the picture. Um, hypodermoclysis also has its limits, such as needing special um, equipment and special training. And parenteral fluid therapy also needs special training. And it will very likely induce nausea and vomiting in a woman that's probably already nauseous and might be vomiting already. So that leaves us with one effective option, and that is proctoclysis. Proctoclysis is, or also rectal fluid infusion therapy, is a low maintenance procedure. It requires no complex training. It is low cost and uses minimal equipment. It requires only a couple of syringes and a catheter or a basic enema kit, which would probably be the easiest for us to get access to. Um, 
It does not require a sterile field because, as we all know, the rectum is not a sterile site. <laughs> and most importantly, it is effective in restoring an effective circulatory volume, and it's effective in providing adequate tissue perfusion to correct hypovolemia. It's effective in preventing death, and it's effective in preventing death, and it is effective in preventing death. That's it. Those are great reasons to use proctocolysis in my book. Um, in conventional medicine, i.e. emergency medicine or wilderness, rural practitioners, they can benefit by using rectal fluid infusion to rehabilitate a subject until other therapy is available, such as a blood transfusion or surgery, or to at least bring up the blood volume a little bit so that they can put an IV if that's their preferred method of fluid therapy. Um, in midwifery, practitioners that are in, as I said, low resource environments where you know, in a country where they might not have access to IVs or the hospital might be two, three days away, you want to have something in your back pocket so that you can, you know, sustain the um, blood volume of your patient until you can transport, if that's even an option. Um, and then again, for certain state jurisdictions, they can benefit from using um, rectal fluid therapy because they just aren't able to do IV. And if you don't want to you know, end up going to the hospital, if you're able to stay home longer, then it's a great option to use um, for clients that are experiencing hyperemesis, dehydration, postpartum hemorrhage, et cetera. Is this evidence-based? Where's the science behind it? Because you know, as midwives, we want to make sure that we're practicing evidence-based practices, right? Um, my examination of several different studies have provided an understanding that the rectal colon does readily absorb fluids, electrolytes, and even drugs across the mucosa. Um, in a study using the rabbit as an animal model, um, they induced hypovolemic shock, and the rabbit's response to the fluid replacement therapy, which was done via the rectum, was measured. Um, using the mean arterial pressure. And you can see here in the control group, the mean arterial pressure was from 21.4, and it only rose up to over 22.1. Um, that's not using proctocolysis. The subject group, the mean arterial pressure went from 21.7 to an average of 38.1 using uh, proctocolysis as a, a therapy, fluid replacement therapy method. So that's a pretty significant increase in the uh, blood volume and the ar arterial pressure. Um, there was a meta-analysis that was done comparing traditional Chinese medicine, and they administered their um, therapies it included drugs, it included herbs via a rectal infusion route, and they compared that therapy versus conventional Western medical therapy, so IV boluses or oral um, medicines. And it was found that the response to the proctocolysis actually matched and or surpassed the Western therapies in the majority of the cases. So. There's some, um, that was a big study that was done. Um, there was also a case study that I found describing a group of doctors that journeyed through some, some mountains in Nepal. And they were um, trekking along and happened upon a 21-year-old Nepalese uh, young man who was with some friends, but they obviously didn't know how to treat the uh, symptoms that he was um, displaying. He had hyperemesis and he was actually vomiting while in, or sorry, he was vomiting blood, so hematemesis. And he was also passing black stool for three days. Um, when the, by the time they found him, he was barely conscious. His respiratory rate was at 32 breaths per minute, so that's 
double the normal respiratory rate. Um, he had severe peripheral vasoconstriction, so that IV access is obviously out of the picture, and non-palpable radial pulses. Um, after their initial resuscitation using rectal fluid infusion, the subject's carotid pulse reduced from 127 beats per minute to 95 beats per minute, and his radial pulse improved from thready and indistinct to palpable. Um, they were able to sustain this man's life for two days, which was the length of time that they had to travel on foot to the nearest um, hospital. And even when they got to that first hospital, the only thing that they could offer this man was a blood transfusion. And he had to be flown out by helicopter, I believe, to uh, receive surgery because he was having a GI bleed. Um, so they were able to save this man's life using rectal fluid infusion because there was no other option. I mean, they were a hospital high in the mountains, and the nearest place was two days on foot. So as you can see, there is evidence to support proctoclysis. So at this point, we are probably all wondering, how do we do this uh, <laughs> fluid replacement therapy? Um, there's three ways. There's the use of a basic enema kit. You can use a catheter and a syringe or you can use the Murphy drip apparatus. And obviously, since the Murphy drip was 100 plus years old, I wasn't able to find enough literature um, to give me a good enough understanding of how to set that up. So I'm going to just go over the first two methods. And um, that should probably cover your bases pretty well. So in either method, you can use a solution of a variety of substances depending on what the purpose of your fluid replacement therapy is. Or, you know, some people actually also call this a nutritive enema. So you're providing nutrients via the rectum for purposes like hyperemesis or dehydration. Um, for those scenarios, you can use raspberry tea. An uh, infusion of raspberry tea. You can use chicken broth. You can use garlic water. Um, anything that you think will be able to provide nutrients um, to your client. And for the postpartum hemorrhage, you do want to have a crystalloid solution that's kind of specific. Um, so a palmful of sugar and a pinch of salt can be added to the normal volume of an enema bag. Or if you happen to have IV solutions on hand, uh, normal saline, that is, you can go ahead and use that as well. But you know, for those of us that are working from you know, a home birth situation, a palmful of sugar and a pinch of salt, you add that to the normal volume of an enema bag, which is 1.5 liters, and there you have your solution. All right. Um, in both methods, I also want to say be sure to boil and filter the water if you're taking it from a lake or a river, if time permits. Because, you know, although the rectum is not a sterile environment, we do want to, you know, stay away from introducing Giardia or some other parasite into the subject, because that won't end well. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm going to explain the catheter syringe method first and then the enema method, uh, just because I feel that the latter is a bit easier to understand. And that's probably what most midwives would go for. Um, OK. So in the catheter syringe method, you'll be administering about 10 to 30 milliliters of the salt solution at a time. And then you're going to give water orally. So basically, the idea is you're administering this crystalloid solution, and you're giving water, if able to, to kind of travel down the gradient, you know? So water is, instead of the water escaping via urine or uh, feces, it will go into the blood volume. Um, if you're getting water from the lake or river, again, please do filter or boil that water. Um, and then 
make sure you cool it to the temperature of or close to the temperature of your patient's body because you don't want to burn them and you don't want it to be too cold either. Um, you'll dissolve your prepared solution into the water, whether it be saline, uh, tea infusion, chicken broth, etc. And then you'll, of course, get informed consent from your patient, as you would with any procedure that's to be done, um, if you know the situation allows that. And assist or allow the patient to lower their clothing. Um, and you can have them lie in a lateral position, so on their side, with one the the top leg kind of you know to the closer to the lateral area of the body, um, or you can do a knee chest position, which probably might be more comfortable for a pregnant woman. Um, you'll wash your hands, glove up, and then draw up sterile water with a 10 milliliter syringe so that you'll be able to inflate the catheter balloon. Once you've done that, you'll just set it to the side and be sure to lube the end of the Foley with a lubricant of some sort. Uh, it could be olive oil, it could be coconut oil, almond oil, whatever you have that's you know, more natural, probably better. Um, and then you'll insert the Foley about four to seven inches into the rectum and inflate the balloon using that 10 mil syringe. Probably no more than about five centimeters you want to go. So once your Foley's in, you will gently tug on it to make sure that you, until you feel, you know, the resistance from the balloon. And you then have the green light to go ahead and start um, infusing your solution. Um, for this method, the reservoir as you saw in the Murphy drip, there was a reservoir at the top holding all of the fluid. Depending on where you are, what kind of situation you're in, um, a syringe, that's a 50 mil syringe will work. You'll just pull the plunger out and you'll pour your solution in there. Or if you don't have a 50 milliliter syringe, you can use a glove that you remove the fingertip of the glove and you'll tape it or attach it in some way or form to the catheter tube. Um, so you have your reservoir set up, your tube's in, and now holding the reservoir with your dominant hand, you'll slowly pour the solution into the reservoir using the other hand. And we want to keep in mind that the reservoir needs to be held, or you can suspend it from a post if you have one, in a position higher than the patient. Um, about hip level is a good spot for this kind of therapy. You don't want it up too high because the, fa the higher you hold it, the faster it will um, drip into the patient. And with rectal fluid infusion or a nutritive enema, if you want to call it that, um, you want to do it as slowly as possible. And yes, Jean, you want to be sure if the patient is on the left side, if you're using a side position for insertion. Yes. All right, so then once you've got the fluid running into the rectum, you will, of course, monitor the patient and adjust the infusion to maintain heart rate, respiratory rate, comfort, and all of that. Um, in your patient. Okay, so the enema method. For this method, you'll be using a basic enema kit and you'll prepare a solution. Again, if water is coming from a river or a lake, please do boil it first and let it cool to the patient's body temperature. Um, Wash your hands, glove up, and once you're all set with that, have the patient lie laterally. Be very careful not to damage the rectum sphincter, as Layla has said. And um, yeah, you can use the lateral lying lateral position or the knee chest position, whichever she'll be more comfortable with, or whichever you feel more comfortable um, administering the therapy as well is important. 
Um, so you want to let air out of the tube by allowing some of the solution to kind of flow down into the tube and then pinch it closed before you even put it anywhere near the patient. Um, and then you will lube the tube, again using olive oil or coconut oil, and insert it about three to four inches into the rectum. The enema tube is going to be a little bit larger in diameter than a Foley, so you'll put it uh, less farther into the rectum. And you'll very slowly begin to administer your solution at a rate of about 0.5 liters per minute. If you have time, um, try to do it a little bit slower than that. Um, but if not, 0.5 liters per minute is a good, a good marker. And again, remember to hold the bag at just about the height of the woman's hip. If lower, you slow down the rate, which is also good. But if time does not permit that, then you work with what you can do. Um, allow about 20 minutes for the entire solution to enter the rectum. If the, if you cannot wait that long, ask the woman to then hold the solution inside of her for as long as she can. And that way it will absorb more of the nutrients, the electrolytes, into the rectum before she kind of lets that um, pass back out. So with this method, again, you want to keep in mind you're doing a super, super slow enema. We don't want to create an, an enema effect like a washout. <laughs> we want it to be slow, we want it to be absorbed into the body, um, and we want to give that rectal portion of the alimentary canal the chance to absorb everything that we are trying to put into the body. Um, not sure if there's any athletes out there, but it's kind of like the same thing when you're coming off of the soccer field or the basketball court during halftime and you're really thirsty, but you know that you can't gobble down a half a bottle of water because, at least for me, like my side would hurt me if I drank a lot of water before, you know, running again. So I would kind of just like put a little bit of water, like a mouthful in my mouth and kind of swish around and let my mouth absorb the water and like swallow just down a little bit down my throat. It's kind of the same idea. You know you're still getting some kind of hydration in your mouth when you put just a little bit of water in there and it's being soaked into the alimentary canal. And that's the same thing that the rectum is doing. You're really slowly allowing it to absorb and um, go into the body. So um, once you've administered your solution, again, make sure to check up on the woman check her vitals, you know, monitor her heart rate, and um, if it is an emergency situation and you're able to do transport to a hospital as soon as possible, of course, um, to treat the underlying problem. Okay, so those are the two methods that um, we can use to do proctoclysis. And just as a recap, proctoclysis does have a place in midwifery and modern medicine today. It's low cost, it's low maintenance, and there's very simple training that's required. And it's effective in retaining fluids and nutrients for use in fluid replacement therapy and to correct hypovolemia and prevent death. And that is the end of my presentation. So we can open up for questions, comments. Thank you, Anneli. That was. Um, I'm not a medical person. I'm not a midwife, as, as my friends on the committee know. But I find that absolutely fascinating and sounded so blindingly obvious the way you described it. It was really interesting. <laughs> so, any questions for Anneli, please? Linda asks, is this used much around the world? Um, I honestly haven't heard of the use of proctoclysis very much around the world, which was kind of what sparked my fascination with it. Um, I have heard of it at, very briefly at a midwifery conference that I attended. 
and the midwife that was presenting kind of like hit it and then ran away. So that wasn't the main um, focus of the presentation. And I was like, well, how is this? And what is this? And how can I find out more about this? And as I was doing my research, it was actually very, very difficult for me to find information about proctoclysis at first because I didn't know the um, medical or Latin terminology for it. And so nutritive enema wasn't popping up anywhere in any of the scholarly journals. <laughs> and uh, very slow enema wasn't popping up. Um, proctoclysis came up in, let's see, it was more so in the use of wilderness medicine. And then certain, like, you know, seasoned midwives that I've talked to know about proctoclysis. So it's not, probably not used much around the world. Probably more people could benefit from using it. Because like I said, it, I mean, it can save a person's life. Well, we can, we can see that Melissa has used it, but I haven't seen anybody else say so yet. And Melissa, would you mind sharing with everyone what your experience with it was? Let me um, switch on Melissa's microphone. Okay, Melissa, I've given you the microphone, um, so if you want to uh, talk us through it, that would be great. Okay, thank you. I had a uh, client who had pretty severe hyperemesis, and mm -hmm. he used the nutritive enema um, to help her. Um, it slowed down the amount of um, that she was vomiting, and she was also able to um, get some energy back. Um, the process we used was very similar to what um, the presenter uh, showed. Um, and we infused very, very slowly um, uh, with just in the comfort of her, of her home, in her own bed. Um, and she actually ended up um, keeping the enema kit and used it um, about every other day um, through the first trimester. And that got her through. So. Um, chances are, if she hadn't had that option available, she would have had to go to the hospital for IV therapy. Right. Yeah. There, there you go. That's, yeah, hyperemesis. A lot of women end up having to go to a hospital. I know, actually, all of the women on my mother's side of the family suffered severe hyperemesis in the first trimester, and they all had to be... Um, hospitalized for a week or more, and if this option was available to them, they probably wouldn't have to, you know, be in a hospital. They'd be able to stay in the comfort of their home, and we could probably get them on some food a little bit sooner than um, what they were able to do. So, yeah. Excellent. Okay, any other questions or shared experiences? It's interesting to me that Linda, who's on the committee and has been 44 years a midwife, has never even heard of it until, until you presented, Annalise. Yeah. Good to have in your back pocket now. Yeah, that, I think that's a common comment we've seen go by. The point is that I don't work in an area where there is um, a need for this because everywhere I've ever worked, we've had um, people who could administer IV fluids or you could get them to somewhere where they could be administered very quickly. So I suppose it's not really something we would even think about or need to think about. That's a good point. We don't have a deal of wilderness, do we, around, all, around here? Nope. Not even in Scotland. Ah. 
Melissa says, right now there's an extreme shortage of IV fluids in the U.S., so this is a great option. I did not know that, Melissa. And I'm sure even especially for midwives to get uh, their hands on some IV fluids. If there's a shortage, we'll probably be the last to get if that's the case. So, yeah. yeah. Um, probably very useful in Nepal right now, Carrie Ann says. Yeah, and there was also a, I think in that general region, there's some medicines that aren't, or drugs, I should say, that aren't even available via IV bolus or oral. So they actually literally have to do um, a rectal fluid infusion, infusion sorry, um, for certain nutrients, like I think phosphate is one of them, and there's a couple other drugs, like in India and Nepal area. So they actually, I suppose then, we could say that they use that in that region of the world more frequently. So if anyone wants to do more research, that might be some Indian or Nepalese doctors might be one of the first, have, probably have a good um, wealth of research and case studies using proctoclysis. Interesting point from Layla in Iran. She says, Layla says, we have to struggle with our medical colleagues to convince them to administer and accept it. Yes, this is true. Especially, I mean, if they've never heard of it, they wouldn't know what the benefits are. Um, yep. Yeah, so I can imagine kind of the struggle of midwives in many countries yes. in general. <laughs> they don't know, so they fear, and yeah, it's a, it's a struggle. Melissa says, distilled water is also recommended for the retention enema. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. If you're not pulling it from a river. Okay, well, we've got still got about... So we've got about five minutes for more, if anyone has any more points or questions. Oh, Carrie Ann says that some medications are administered via the rectum in Australia. Interesting. Yeah. And my facilitator says that in New Zealand also. And Linda says in the UK as well. So, there's their proof that the rectum absorbs drugs or anything just as well as, you know, a venous or intraosseous um, therapy. They use the rectum for administering medications. There's their proof right there. Uh, Jean wants to know what medications are administered via the rectum. Melissa says Cytotec, Miso, Methoprestin, uh huh, Diclofenac, Diclofenac, what in? Yeah. Ah, paracetamol in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. Great. Megan says they use um They do use a rectal fluid infusion of some sort after 
a mother is hemorrhaged, but they only administer it after suturing. So yeah, if you want, if you um, are able to manage that hemorrhage without administering the therapy first, and you suture, and you just kind of want to top up her blood volume um, so that she feels not woozy. It might not be emergent, but it's still a good idea. Um, if she's bled more than normal, you can go ahead and administer the therapy. Okay, a couple more minutes and then we'll need to bring this to a close so we can change over for the next presentation. But uh, we can see people are really interested in um, in what you said and related experiences, aren't they? I'm so glad that I could share this. Okay, I think oh, we'll just see what Megan has to say, and then I think I'll probably draw it to a close. Um. All right, well, thank you, everyone, and I hope you can all use this information in the future. And happy International Day of Midwifery again. <laughs>